The kind of technology the Osprey required took a lot of steps to get to. For those who don't know or have forgotten, here's how it was in the beginning with a bit of my history, along with pictures of proof, and then the flight of the new banana hobby Osprey. Hello folks, I'm going to show you something new today. It's a V-22 tilt rotor Osprey from Arctic and pioneered by the Marines. Well, Arctic makes some good stuff like my EF-2000 Eurofighter jet, so I was intrigued by the ad. They make a K-22 tilt rotor model also, it's kind of mash looking, but I wanted the Osprey, you know? Before I show you the pros and cons, I want to mention this. You know, many of you know that I've been an inventor and part of the RC pioneering process all my life. Every single one of my projects were documented and published. My international newsletter went out to all model aeronautics publications and clubs, including the AMA. Everybody knew what I was doing. So when I see an ad today saying something is new, I can't help but chuckle because my friends and I were doing all this stuff, this new stuff, over 20 years ago. When I wrote the first article ever published on RC Night Flying, it was titled RC Night Flying Believe It or Not. Why? Well, most people thought it was impossible because people could hardly fly in a daylight, let alone at night. I developed a way to see the plane's lights from any angle on the ground, so I wrote about it, because you can't fly it if you can't see it. There were only green low intensity LEDs back then too, and chemical lights weren't very great. Today the night flyers figure they're doing something new. I think flying Christmas trees are fabulous to watch, but as a flyer on the ground and pilot, I stick to the FAA colors to stay oriented. You know, like real life. Well, now the latest thing is thrust vectored fans and props. Well, I experimented with that over 20 years ago too, with cables controlled by servos on a Joe Breedy Tercel glider. It worked really great, and that was also published in the International Newsletter. Here's a few pictures. And you know, I'm actually surprised it's taken this long for thrust vectoring to actually be added to models. A lot of you know that I invented and am now flying the smallest single rotor blade no tar helicopter in the world after proving to myself that it just uses less power to turn one blade than two, plus other benefits that you can see in my other videos. Well, having all the trouble with tail rotors, I decided to get rid of the tail rotor altogether. So I'd found that after having a few tail rotor failures in flight, that I could fly in and land like an airplane, no problem, if I didn't panic. Well, I decided to develop a simple heli that anyone could fly with only a two-channel radio. Here's a few pictures of the original prototypes and the test flights. You know, all I was doing was just showing people that they could think outside the box. So with the help of Chun Park, the CEO of High Tech RCD and now Multiplex 2, Kyoshu got to see the prototype tape of me flying what I called the grasshopper chopper in the beginning. I was never trying to sell anything, however the Kyosho company is honorable and they actually paid me for my Hyperfly Notar design and gave me credit as the inventor. But even back then, where there were no computers, no cell phones, no iPods, no 2.4 GHz, no speed controllers electronic, no lipos, I was inventing and trying stuff and publishing all my experiments. Besides that first no-tail rotor RC helicopter, I was working on counter-rotating helicopters. In reality, the first one was a free flight and was from L.M. Cox Manufacturing. It had an 049 gas engine on the rotor. It ran a small prop one way and the counter torque spun the rotor the other way. No tail rotor was needed. I also got a laugh when somebody tells me I should try FPV. Well, we did that over 20 years ago with a TV downlink on my Concept 30 helicopter. Here's a few pictures of that that were also published. Besides, the last FPV that I had flew out of range. You know, I want to fly my planes, not sit in the follow me mode, like on the computer. I can do that anytime. Well, then I began experimenting, and with the help of my friend Dave Robinger, a machinist, uh, we were able to come up with a counter-rotating machine which swung the weight of the servos for direction control. It worked pretty good. It was also tethered. Here's a couple of pictures. Then baby steps happened as the manufacturers with money to spend and equipment to manufacture jumped on the wagon. Just look what it's turned into. Here's a few pictures of what's going on today. 
Well, when electric helis began hitting the market big time, we still had only NICADs. Nickel metal hydrides were still in their infancy, and of course no lipos. So I began flying these helis on 12 volt batteries connected to the helicopter by a tether. Here's a few pictures. The Skylark EH-1 was the first mass-produced electric and was the best for this. Then I developed a way to keep the receiver and the receiver battery on the ground making the heli lighter by using a cabled transmitter with a receiver inside it to fly it. Well, I began working on and the next thing I was successfully developed the electric tail rotor motor for my EH-1 heli for Ishimasha in Japan. All that was published and the videotapes were sent to everybody including them and to show my success and show how it worked. Well, Kyosho eventually bought them out. Well, in order to make the complicated speed controls for them, I got Vic from Victor Engineering to save the day. Good friend of mine, and here's the picture of the speed controller that we made to work. Nobody was working on speed controllers for electric tail rotor motors anywhere in the whole world or would have known about it. It was complex, and he did it. The bigger side of it was for the main rotor and the smaller for the tail rotor. It was hard to mix the two. And since the ETRM worked pretty good, I decided to try to get that heavy tail motor off the tail. Well, we did it and it worked, and instead of shafts and gears, I elected to try to use a cable-driven rotor, as you can see. It worked great, and it was also published worldwide, including in Radio Helicopter magazine. Here's a picture of a model that uses the internal tail rotor motor up near the main shaft. So when I got an email from Banana Hobby that they had a tilt rotor V22 Osprey with a patented design, I couldn't help but think back 20 years when Dave Robinger and I attached two Hyperfly rotor assemblies to a frame to simulate an Osprey. Well, that project, due to counter-rotating blades and nowhere to get the two opposing sets, got shelved. Plus, it was difficult mixing without today's electronics and that bogged us down, so no pictures were ever published. Dave Robinger still has the original prototype out in California, and I think I'm going to try and get it back to resurrect it. Our Osprey, however, was more maneuverable because it had cyclic swash plates, where this Artec one does not. The Artec, however, does have a very unique way of controlling, and the design is quite brilliant. And I must say that this machine does not fly like any heli or plane I've ever flown. And I've still not exactly figured out how to trim it. But I do recommend flying it on a smooth surface with a lot of room, like a gym, to figure out the controls. I don't recommend flying it in the wind as it easily gets upset by any gust. Well, this aircraft cost $149 plus shipping and it came with four blades. I have yet to break any blades, but I have broken the blade holders and if anything, that's what spares they should include in the kit. So the bottom line is this. Don't expect to just pick this up and fly it like a helicopter, because it's intimidating. And until you get it figured out, it will not fly hands off. But, as you can see in flight, it sure is great looking, and the sky, and it's certainly unique. And due to my Marine Corps heritage, I can now say I have flown an Osprey. Oh, yeah.
that's a pretty cool machine. Good job, Art Tech.